Good afternoon, and welcome to our Florida Priorities, Priorities panel, The COVID Crisis, Returning to Work and Looking Ahead. I'm Monica Richardson, the new executive editor of the Miami Herald and the El Nuevo Herald, and Florida regional editor for McClatchy, our parent company. I'm entering my fourth month here at the Miami Herald and El Nuevo Herald, and very excited to be here with you all. I'm truly honored to be a leader in this Miami community. On behalf of the teams in each of our newsrooms, we want to welcome you today and thank you for joining us. Florida Priorities originated in 2018 as an annual summit featuring thought leaders discussing ideas and new solutions to the most pressing and important issues facing Florida. In 2020, it evolved into a new series that happened because we needed to turn to virtual events throughout the year. Today, we have gathered a thoughtful and engaged panel with important insights and opinions. We will explore where we are now in the pandemic and where we're going, including the gradual return to in-person work in South Florida, what safety measures look like, how to address the social and economic disparities exacerbated by the outbreak, and how prepared or unprepared we are for yet another pandemic if that should happen. We hope our Florida Priorities panel discussions bring you insight and add value to your conversations and encourage change in our communities. So let me turn now to introducing our moderator for today, Nancy Ancrum. Nancy is the editorial page and editorial board editor for the Miami Herald. She's been in that role since 2013, and she's been at the Miami Herald since 1983. Nancy is one of our most connected journalists in the room and someone you should get to know. Nancy will moderate what I can promise will be an engaging and informative discussion today. Please be sure to let us know what you think about today's event and sign up for future events. And please, if you're not a subscriber, consider making us your local news source for information. And again, thank you for being here today and welcome. And now I'll turn it over to you, Nancy. Thank you very much, Monica. Our communities have shown themselves to be resilient in the face of challenge over and over, whether these challenges are hurricanes, social unrest, or economic downturns. But resilience takes commitment and a plan. And as we emerge from the wreckage of the COVID-19 pandemic, our panelists can help us plot the way to the other side. If viewers have questions, I encourage them to write their questions in the comments section, and I will ask as many as time allows. David Martin is the CEO of Miami-based development firm Terra, which holds a portfolio of 5 million square feet of residential and commercial real estate. A Miami native, Mr. Martin says he wants to make sure his hometown is built to last, incorporating green space, resilient construction methods, transit connectivity, and renewable energy in Terra's projects. Dr. Mary Jo Trepka is a professor and chair of FIU's Department of Epidemiology, Robert Stemple College of Public Health and Social Work. She received the 2010 Presidential Early Career Award for Science and Engineering from President Barack Obama for her work on analyzing the role of poverty and segregation in racial disparities in surviving HIV. She is currently leading a study on the influence of the COVID-19 pandemic on people living with HIV. Daniela Levine Cava is the first woman to lead Miami-Dade County, having been elected mayor in November 2020. Both in and out of elected office, she has been a committed advocate for families in South Florida. In 1996, she founded Catalyst Miami to help low- and middle-income families through service, education, and advocacy. Catalyst helps 5,000 people each year become more self-sufficient and engaged in their communities. Ben Konark is the Miami Herald's reporter covering the coronavirus pandemic. Before joining the Herald in August 2019, he was an investigative reporter covering criminal justice at the Florida Times Union in Jacksonville. I'd like to welcome all of our panelists, and I am going to start with Ben to lay the foundation for the rest of this talk. Ben, as a reporter doing a deep dive last year into the pandemic, when did you know that this virus was going to be, was going to plague this community well beyond our naive expectations? Thanks for the question, Nancy. Um, I'm just gonna adjust my, all right. Um, so yeah, so it was something I was obviously monitoring in January as we started to learn more about the emergence of this disease um, in 
and Wuhan uh, in China. Um, but I will say when it really became sort of a, uh, apparent to me that this was going to affect all of our lives personally um, was when I was listening to a podcast between a Harvard epidemiologist and a Harvard professor, uh, the, epi the epidemiologist being Mark Lipsitch. And this was towards the end of February where he basically shared an estimate of his that 40 to 70 percent of the world's population would eventually become infected with COVID. Um, you were not hearing much of that around that time, but as that kind of got me to pay a lot closer attention. And then um, what I found was basically not a lot of people disagreeing with him. Um, so after I heard that podcast, I went to my editor's desk, uh, Amy Driscoll, who was our healthcare editor, um, and basically said, hey, have you heard this? I, I shared the podcast with her and she had a lot of experience um, navigating the public health crises in South Florida, so the Zika. Um, she'd done a lot of work on HIV AIDS in Miami, Dade, Broward County. So this was something that was on our radar pretty early. Um, and we both started following it really closely around the end of February. Um, so we were ready uh, in March when it eventually got here, um, it, it kind of the beginning of March. You and I talked earlier and you said that it was something akin to covering a war. Um, who was the enemy here? I think the virus is, is the enemy. Um, and and what makes it so difficult or, or so warlike was that there was just everyone was um, in the dark, right? We didn't know anything about this virus. And, and something that um, has stuck with me is that we still, a year into this pandemic, there's no pill you can take. Um, there's no uh, infusion you can get. Um, there is no magic bullet for this virus, right? We, we still don't have a, a, an effective treatment, um, but what we do have now is a vaccine. Um, but before we had those vaccines, we really had nothing um, that was a real game changer. Uh, we obviously, we saw physicians get a lot better at treating this virus, um, but there is no uh, real treatment, so to speak, for this virus. Uh, many times we saw that access to information, especially um, state health statistics, uh, was very difficult, was uh, sometimes withheld, possibly skewed. Uh, did you, can you talk about your process, the process briefly as to whether you had trouble accessing uh, vital information to pass on to people? Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's been a common theme, I would say, of the pandemic. And I think something that we've experienced with past public health crises in South Florida, um, getting accurate and timely information from the state and the Department of Health. Uh, I would say uh, that it, you know, I, I, I don't think there's evidence that any of the data has been skewed necessarily, but it's been difficult to obtain at times. The best example I can think of is current hospitalization data, which the Miami Herald really um, spearheaded the charge to get the state to release that. And I think it's worth noting that the state only did release it after we, through sourcing um, people at the DOH and figuring out where exactly the, these data were kept, um, you know, we basically kind of forced the state's hand saying, we know you have this, every other state is publishing it, why are you not releasing it? And the state of Florida did not start releasing current hospitalization data until I, I believe it was the beginning of July. Um, so it was several months into the pandemic. Uh, that's a pretty good example of transparency or lack thereof and the role of the news media in making sure that the state is sharing at the very least what it has uh, with the public. Um, and it's a pretty important metric, as I'm sure Dr. Trepka could tell you, um, hospitalizations is one of the most reliable metrics we have as far as gauging spread in our community. So it was, uh, and it was also something that we were getting from Miami-Dade County under former uh, County Mayor Jimenez. So it was pretty um, odd that the state took so long to start releasing it. Sure. I asked you earlier um, when you knew that we were in for a really rough time. When did you know that we were turning a, co uh, a corner as, as a reporter? I would say uh, December when we started covering the vaccine and its arrival at our healthcare facilities. The first press conference I went to was at Memorial up in Broward. And then a day or two later, I was down at Jackson with uh, the mayor um, to announce that the uh, healthcare workers at Jackson were getting this vaccine. But as I kind of alluded to earlier, uh, I mean, these vaccines are the first time we've had any any kind of weapon uh, to fight back against this virus with. It's the first time we've been able to go on the defense or the offensive rather and, and protect ourselves from this virus. So once that was real, it was here, 
that was the game changer everyone was waiting for because for the first time in the course of the pandemic we had something that we could use that was stronger than the virus and um you know if you follow uh the public health experts even even now uh with all the uncertainty we're starting to see cases rise again and there's a lot of reasons to be concerned it, it's a completely different picture when you have a vaccine and you can shield um, some of the most vulnerable people. And I think our biggest challenge right now is making sure we get to those people before the virus gets to them. Thank you so much. Dr. Trepka, Ben just told us what happened. Can you look ahead and tell us what now needs to happen in terms of uh, public health measures? After all, we've just heard Dr. Rochelle Walensky, the head of the CDC, the CDC director say, she has a sense of impending doom because she fears another surge. Well, I, I, I feel more hopeful because of the vaccine, but, but it is true. Um, we're, we're in a race right now. We're in a race between getting people vaccinated and getting control over the SARS-CoV-2 virus within Florida. Um, we, we've been, after coming off of a, a, a very high peak in, in early January, we've come down in terms of numbers of cases and the proportion of people testing positive uh, here in Miami-Dade County and also in Florida. But um, in Florida, we're, we're, it's, we've now plateaued. In Florida, it's even possible we are starting to increase as well. And so um, I am very concerned also given the variants that, that we will see an, another wave. Um, and it's so important that we get everybody vaccinated as soon as possible and that we keep control of our transmission so that we don't have um, the emergence of even more variants or the variants that we do have that they don't further mutate um, to something that the vaccines can't deal with. Um, can you talk about um, the degree to which variants are already here and the degree to which the vaccinations that people are getting are effective, will be effective against them? I think that's a question on everyone's minds. So the, the predominant variant we have in Florida is the, the variant from the United Kingdom, and the things do seem to work against that variant. So so that's very good news. I I the concern is though that the virus will con will further mutate if we if we have so much transmission continuing or if it even increases. Mm -hmm. so that that's that's the the theoretical concern. The good thing is that we can relatively quickly modify the mRNA vaccines. That is the the, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine to to deal with with uh, new variants. But it, it is really really crucial that we get. Um, not only the 65 plus population vaccinated, which by the way, they've, we've done a great job with that. Almost 70% of that population here in Miami-Dade County has been vaccinated, at least with one dose. But the younger people, the people who are probably involved in the most amount of transmission, we need to get those people vaccinated as well to bring down the overall levels of virus within the community. How many, what percentage of people in this community um, must be vaccinated for everyone to remain fairly safe. Um, I, I can only imagine that there are people in this community who, for any number of reasons, will not get the vaccine. Yeah, so the, uh, the, the precise number is actually unknown. We think probably somewhere between uh, 70 to 80 percent of people need to be immune. So we do have some people who, who might have current immunity because of recent COVID infection, um, and then the people who are vaccinated on top of that. Uh, one of the problems that we have is uh, right now children cannot get the vaccine, and people under 18 are about 19 percent of the Miami-Dade County community. So we have to practically get um, almost everybody vaccinated among adults. Now we do again. We do have some people who have who might still have some natural immunity. We know that you get some natural immunity at least about three months after your uh, after a natural infection. Um, but um, we know how well that persists. And so that's why even people who, who have had COVID-19 should still get the vaccine. We have a question, uh, question from one of our viewers, Cynthia Absher. She asks, will we need to have a COVID shot every year like we get an annual flu shot? 
I think it's highly likely we're going to need boosters. What the frequency of that boost of those boosters is not known at this point. Um, the boosters are needed because of waning immunity. Although those people, even people vaccinated in the trial, they still seem to have good immunity right now. But you know, the trials were done last fall, so mm -hmm. we have years of experience. So probably we will need a booster. In addition, um, that booster may be need, may need to be changed over time to deal with the prevailing, prevailing variants. So uh, yes, I foresee a future where we're gonna be having regular boosters of the, of the coronavirus vaccine. I see. Thank you very much. Uh, Mayor Levine Tava, Dr. Trepka is on top of the healthcare aspect of this pandemic. As mayor, you have to be on top of everything else. How are you prioritizing the components of Miami-Dade's recovery from the pandemic? What, what's first, what's second, what's third in your estimation? Well, thank you so much for having me on. And I listen to Dr. Trepp. Uh, we really get an update from her uh, with all the data. Let me say that lives and livelihoods both are critically important. Uh, number one is lives or health. So early in the pandemic, as a commissioner, I was very active in promoting protections. Now as mayor, of course, I've continued to prioritize the protections uh, mm -hmm. to, to make sure that people have access to the health care that they need, um, that uh, we do everything possible to prevent the spread of the disease through the basic precautions that are well known, the, the basics of masking, um, social distancing and disinfection, contact tracing, uh, these are all essential components that work, and we need to double down and, and make sure that we persist in those. Uh, but then also looking ahead to the economy's recovery and, of course, doing everything possible to steer us through those difficult times when so many lost jobs, they lost uh, businesses, they lost life savings, they've lost mm -hmm. um, homes in some cases. Of course, we've had an eviction moratorium, which has been somewhat controversial, but it was designed by the CDC nationally to make sure that people did not have to be out of homes and more exposed to the virus and also to deal with the humanitarian aspects. So I'm focused on uh, making sure we get through this with the, the best health outcomes, least loss of lives and serious health conditions, as well as steering the ship to economic renewal. And we're past talking about recovery because we really can see the light at the end of the tunnel. And now we're looking at the kinds of, of economic uh, renewal that not only brings back the businesses that have struggled uh, and have adapted, so many of them, but also the new economy, things that are emerging as opportunities, some of them as a result of the pandemic. Can you be specific about what you are seeing as uh, one, economic renewal, and two, a new economy that has really sprung from the, the pandemic itself. Yes. Well, let's start with infrastructure. We do have a lot of uh, good um, interest at the state and federal level in investing in infrastructure. That's often the path out of a recession, is to build using government funds, and that is, in fact, at the forefront. Uh, we'll be able to invest in uh, some shovel-ready projects. The uh, congressional delegation is going to sponsor some. The state legislature is passing certain pots of money that can go as well. And uh, the Biden administration, not only through the American Rescue Plan, but through additional infrastructure items that they're bringing forward, will allow us to invest in water and sewer projects like our septic to sewer, which is so critical to protect our, our bay, uh, prevent pollution. Also, some of our transit projects that have been um, in the pipeline and are so necessary. Uh, the housing affordability, uh, one of our Achilles heels here, uh, we should be able to direct more funds uh, towards uh, those kinds of projects as well. So those are jobs uh, as well. They are infrastructure needs, but they are jobs. And we're working with Career Source to do some reskilling and retraining. Uh, and we're also, of course, uh, becoming a tech darling capital. Uh, now we have an arena that's named after uh, FTX, a, techs, uh, a tech uh, cryptocurrency exchange company. So we have a lot of interest in 
moving individuals and businesses here. So uh, we're going to ride that wave and make sure that it benefits our local residents, not only welcoming newcomers, but uh, creating the pipeline for training, apprenticeship programs, <clears throat> and also investing in our local startups to scale ups. Uh, so we have a lot of opportunity growing out of this. We have an initiative called Renew 305. It's an acronym uh, with a lot of good things packed into it. And uh, we have a lot of boosters. We have uh, our business boosters. Uh, as well as our vaccine boosters that are very excited. Uh, CEOs, they're talking to other CEOs to lure them to the paradise uh, that we call home. Um, Renew 305, you said it's packed with goodies. Uh, can you give us an example of a couple of goodies in there? Well, uh, for sure, the first R is about reviving. Uh, we do have a very robust entrepreneurship system and we need to be sure to invest in that entrepreneurship ecosystem. Um, we do have businesses that have adapted um, during this pandemic, but we need to make sure that they have the capital to, to move forward. And uh, they, they've done their part to keep the, the, uh, their uh, business customers and their employees safe. Uh, but we need to make sure that we, we support them as they emerge and as, as our tourism economy, for example, comes back. Also, the cruising industry, uh, you know, that is obviously a very, very hard hit uh, because of the pandemic. We're hoping that the uh, Center for Disease Control is going to allow us to move forward with protocols to reopen safe cruising. Uh, we have conversations uh, coming forward on that. Um, we also are uh, working on economic partnerships. So uh, we, again, the federal, state, uh, local, investing in the infrastructure ideas that I've mentioned, and then uh, W for workforce. So Career Source has already invested $2 million in our reskilling and upskilling programs so that we can be sure that these new jobs are uh, not only attracting newcomers, but are, are benefiting our local residents. Uh, that is very, very important to us, especially I have my Office of Equity and Inclusion. We want to be sure nobody's left behind and that these things uh, benefit our, our local residents. And uh, the American Rescue Plan is uh, scheduled to send us, uh, again, another half billion dollars. Uh, so we are very excited that that will allow us to continue our humanitarian relief for those struggling, uh, more housing relief, um, the infrastructure, but also to, to uh, deal with some of the health issues, including mental health. Let's just talk about mental health for a minute, which mm -hmm. uh, all of us in uh, such a state of anxiety, many depressed, isolated, um, you know, just some sense of normalcy for folks as they get the vaccine, but, but truly the, the uh, post-traumatic stress, the impact on, on, on children from the schooling losses, so many, so many challenges that we're going to need to provide some additional help uh, from a psychological perspective as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mr. Martin, you've been, a, you know, the mayor just talked about adapting and adaptation, and you've been able to use challenge as something onto, in which you have also found opportunity. What aspects of the pandemic's negative effects on this community and its economy do you think will allow businesses to emerge smarter going forward? I think you are on mute. So I definitely think the pandemic has given a, uh, has given people reason to rethink where they live, how they live, how they shop, uh, where they work. Uh, and all these concepts are going to have a lasting impact on the, on the way we plan, build, and, and use real estate. Um, you know, this pandemic is, has really accelerated uh, a lot of disruptors in our community. Uh, technology, for instance, and how we use technology. Uh, our mobility is now different, the way we're learning, uh, the way our children are learning at school, uh, with remote learning, uh, remote working now, becoming part of our uh, you know, future way of, uh, of having our employees, uh, you know, be in a more affordable way, not having to drive to, to, to work every day. So what, what I think this pandemic has done is it's created a, 
uh, an opportunity for us to to rethink our, our business mind, our, our business plans, and mm -hmm. and come up with a uh, uh, come up with new ways of, of being more efficient, uh, new ways of uh, of being able to channel uh, better talent, uh, and and also new ways of training our talent. Uh, many people in our organization today are working from home, uh, in, in, in part of the week and part of the week they're working uh, at, at the office. And I think uh, that balance, I think, is providing a lot of uh, uh, new opportunities and a, and a lot of a cheaper cost of living, if you will, and that people no longer need to drive to work uh, every day uh, and can save some of those, uh, those dollars for their own families. So, so I think definitely technology has been disrupting our, our office environment, our office culture. And I think those organizations and companies that can adapt to that, I think are gonna be able to retain and, and recruit the best talent uh, that's in our community. Uh, you know, secondly, I think that, you know, the pandemic has really evolved how we, how we wanna live, uh, like I mentioned earlier. And, and so what we see is uh, a growth of, uh, of new housing typologies. Uh, of, of, of looking at ways to use the planning zoning code uh, in, a, in a way to, to kind of solve some of society's needs. Uh, rather than only having high rises or single family, really looking at that middle market to, to see where we can grow affordable housing. Uh, now with the new administration at the federal level, uh, you know, we all see a, a, a need or, or a, a guide of uh, more funding uh, for affordable housing. And, and so for us, uh, traditionally over the last decade, we've been relying on tax credits in order to create these affordable housing units. And it's concentrated affordable housing in specific neighborhoods. And so what we see now with this uh, new funding and guidance is we see a, an ability to now sprinkle affordable housing throughout all communities uh, and, and looking at ways of creating a three-story product and and a, a little more gentle density within our uh, within our, our neighborhoods, uh, uh, proximate to transit, et cetera, that I think is, is really gonna see us a further growth. Uh, the pandemic's also kind of uh, revived some of our suburbs. Um, you know, traditionally our, our there, there was a big move to urbanism, which we all believe in and hope and, and will continue. Uh, but we do see a lot more investment, a lot more interest in our suburban communities. Uh, people today, you know, want somewhat low density living. They want to be able to, to raise their families and grow, grow their businesses in places that there's a significant amount of out, outdoors and, and, and they could have a affordable uh, a townhomes, affordable single family units. Uh, and so for us, what we see is we see a, we, a continued demand for our industry in the residential business uh, in, in real estate. And, and we see a a continued demand even from retailers. We've been seeing a lot of the small business environment uh, somewhat, um, you know, have some challenges uh, during the pandemic. And, and I think uh, overall, as, as what this pandemic has done is it's uh, really, you know, re rethinking how retail centers are gonna be going forward, uh, you know, and, and really how these small businesses can be part of this new economy or this post pandemic economy. So I think there's opportunities. It's just a question of, you know, what's the right uh, industry and, and, and what is that entrepreneur looking to achieve and, and how they're using technology to really uh, uh, boost and, 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 and grow their, their platform in order to, to have a, a resilient business plan. How will the residential, the demand for, for residential, um, how will that be affected by what we, uh, what's being predicted as more remote working, people who are staying home and and conducting business. Is that also driving uh, the interest in the suburbs? I think I think what we all did during the pandemic and, and during the lockdown phases, et cetera, we spent a lot more time in our home. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that that's uh, brought about a, 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 a new sense of, uh, really caring how their home environment really is laid out. And, uh, you know, and so, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, we have two children and, and uh, it was a little noisy uh, to work from home and uh, a little more difficult. And so 
what we're what we're designing today in, in some of our newer products is uh, in our buildings we're designing somewhat more office uh, buildings if you will within our residential buildings and, and in our single family and garden apartments we're designing our floor plans to incorporate an office uh, for for families we're also improving our Wi-Fi connectivity and low voltage uh, uh, improvements in order to to really have uh, and, and it's something that I think we we need to look at countywide is you know how we can improve uh, uh, connectivity throughout our communities uh, in all communities in order to to really have a, a an efficient way of speaking on cell phones an efficient way of, uh, of working from home uh, so that we don't have that downtime or, or those uh, disruptions that maybe lose some of the efficiency once you work from home but what we def definitely see uh, and we need to look at our zoning laws today there's uh, several cities have uh, a percentage of the home that can be allocated to, to a home office. Uh, the question is, does that uh, does that need to be looked at as we reimagine kind of how we're gonna uh, work in the future? Uh, so those are some of the uh, kind of uh, nuances to, to residential living and, and kind of in this post-pandemic world. Uh, one little tidbit is, you know, our firm is also looking for our new projects, looking at air quality systems mm -hmm. uh, to really, uh, you know, not only uh, improve and purify uh, and ionize, the, you know, the air in order to have, you know, given the humidity we have, uh, you know, really trying to to, to uh, dehumidify, if you will, a lot of our residential homes and, and residential product. But, but we also have to look at, you know, how we can improve the data and the collection of data as it relates to the buildings we're building. Uh, not only from a sustainability standpoint and how we could track our electric, our electrical, reduce our electrical needs and loads uh, to try to reduce some of our reliance on uh, and impacts on uh, on our uh, energy sources, but but we also need to focus on on our air quality and how we track that uh, at different times of the year and different times of the day. And when it comes to uh, commercial spaces. How are they going to have to adapt to a year and then some of consumers often getting just about everything they want delivered to their doorstep? I think that you know prior to the pandemic, we saw a shift. Um, we saw how technology and e-commerce was somewhat um, impacting uh, uh, the retail environment. Uh, and really, the pandemic has accelerated that. Uh, but what we see is um, uh, organizations and companies and retailers today are looking at their retail stores as not only uh, a retail store for the customer, for a physical customer, but also as a place for fulfillment, uh, mm -hmm. as a place to really look at urban fulfillment in a different way, in a different light. Uh, you know, today we have the industrial product. Within that industrial product, you have heavy industrial and you have light industrial. And when we look at light industrial, Within that, we have a lot of logistics, e-commerce, and urban fulfillment. And more and more, as, as companies are looking to deliver products quicker to clients, and uh, we're seeing our retail centers somewhat having a, a retail showrooms, kind of a bricks and clicks strategy, uh, in order to, to basically have uh, customers that can really uh, physically see their goods or, or experiences, th their services, but also from that retail store, be able to operate and function their e-commerce platform. Mm -hmm. So I think overall, uh, you know, if not all entrepreneurs and small businesses, but most of the small businesses really are, are, are utilizing technology in a way that I think is, uh, is going to continue to, to, to be long term. And I think our retail environments are really going to uh, experience a different type of a retail, uh, a retailer, uh, a different type, uh, I think, food and beverage and restaurants today, for instance, are gonna to continue to be in our retail centers. But again, with Uber Eats and some of those uh, delivery mechanisms, I think it's a way of them growing their revenue. And 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 so overall, I, I, some of the uh, businesses of the past that had strategies and, and, and business plans that worked in the 80s and 90s and 2000s and even 2010s, I think 2020, you know, beyond, uh, I think more and more technology uh, and e-commerce are going to be part of the uh, retail centers, uh, 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 you know, uh, you know, ideas and, and ecosystem. And I think it's something that that is going to make our businesses much more sustainable and and also make them 
you know, focus on, on, on looking at the new world and adapting because uh, I think our, our, our entire community and one thing South Florida has always been able to do, whether it was an environmental disasters or economic impacts, uh, we always adapt and, and come out more stronger, more resilient. And I think our families and businesses are, are going to do that from this pandemic. Thank you so much. I want to thank all of our panelists for sharing their expertise. Uh, I'm going to open up, open it up to uh, some of our uh, viewers' questions, and this will be kind of the free-for-all <laughs> section. Anyone is free to answer. Um, this might go um, speak directly, though, to Dr. Trepka and Mayor Levine Kava. This is from Alex Jr. Uh, as workplaces open up, are there contact, contact tracing protocols and requirements in place for uh, employers? And is there a coordination effort between employers and uh, Miami-Dade County Public Schools? Mayor Levine Kava, Dr. Dr. Trepka? Well, I'll say first so, that this contact tracing has been a source of real frustration to me because we could have gotten it right at the beginning and there was very big reluctance on the part of the state to have a robust content tracing program. And by the time Tony with some pressure from me took up contact tracing, a, the, the virus was so rampant it was kind of harder to tamp it down. We did also have isolation rooms available for people who could not safely isolate at home. Number one place that people do get the virus is from their family members. So it is really important that we do isolate. Uh, and uh, initially, some healthcare workers were provided with isolation housing. Uh, but over time, hotel rooms were made available through the state. And uh, people took us up on it, but not at the numbers that they should have. So uh, contact tracing, I know from experiences that uh, friends and family had, was not as aggressively pursued um, and, and could have been and should have been. That to be said, in the county, it's been taken very seriously in county government. And whenever there was uh, an identified case, there was deep cleaning, there was evacuation of the premises of the, of the area. Uh, and and quarantining until people were safe to come home. Um, I, I know the schools do similarly. If a child shows up or a teacher shows up with the infection, then there's a massive um, dislocation uh, for the necessary period of time. As far as coordination, uh, I wouldn't say so. Not so much. Uh, Dr. Trepka might have some additional information. Dr. Trepka? Yeah, no, I don't think that there's much coordination, um, although I, I work at the, the Department of Health, so I don't know exactly everything that they have going on. Um, I can see with respect to the schools, their strategy at the schools is if there's one case, then all the children and all the classes of that child um, will, will be quarantined, as will all those teachers. And that has caused so much disruption uh, for both the kids as well as it made things very difficult for all the teachers too. I know my own child has been quarantined. I don't know how many times for how many weeks, but anyway, I think that means that two things. One, it is going to be extraordinarily important that what that once the vaccine is 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 authorized for children, that children get vaccinated as well. This is for their benefit, the benefit of their families, the benefit of their teachers, and also. They can have um, less disruption to their to their their schoolwork. Um, so, the other thing is, I think as we as we get more people vaccinated, we will see fewer cases, and then contact tracing is actually going to be even more important because we'll be able to to the, the health department will be able to do a better job of it, and we'll be better able to get down our our rates of new infections down to very low levels. So, I think there's a lot of improvement to do with respect to contact tracing. And I and I think particularly with the schools um, that it is extraordinarily important that that um, we get a handle over the SARS-CoV-2 virus because the children um, have really suffered during this pandemic. And and you had said that you know, my interest and expertise is health. Yes, it is. Um, but not just about SARS-CoV-2. Um, I, I, 
I really believe that in terms of long-term health, the, the major factor that is going to predict how the future health of our community is what we do to help children make up for lost learning outcomes and how we address uh, gaps in educational attainment that have gotten exacerbated as a result of the, the pandemic. Thank you. Uh, uh, ben Konark, I'd like to ask you as a reporter, um, can you give us a, a timeline or, or, or just fill us in on the, the, the lackluster contact, contact tracing program in the state? What, 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 what happened? Well, I mean, I, I wish I could answer uh, the question of what happened. Um, I think I would deserve a raise if I could. But, um, you know, the, the state has been, uh, you know, I would say I sense the same uh, resistance to really go into detail about contact tracing. In the last year, I've done a grand total of one interview um, mm -hmm. with the Department of Health official who would be willing to get on the phone with me and talk about contact tracing. It's been one of the most surprising um, aspects of the COVID response here that the Miami-Dade office of the D State Department of Health has refused to talk to me about contact tracing, um, saying that basically it's up to Tallahassee. Uh, and as we kind of uh, have discussed, you know, this is a public health measure that requires public buy-in, it requires trust. And how do you build trust with the public uh, to participate in contact tracing if you won't talk about it? You won't talk about what your aims are, what your goals are from doing it. We did throw a lot of money at it, um, but it never appeared to be working properly. There was a contractor brought in. Um, so, you know, long story short, I just think that there was a desire to have contact tracing from the state, but there was never really a um, investment made in getting community buy-in for this process that, um, you know, requires a lot of community buy-in. Uh, so I would say that's one way that we've really fallen short. Um, in recent days, actually, within the last week, I've been messaging uh, with DOH again, um, basically trying to get them to put someone on the phone with me to talk about contact tracing, saying, hey, you know, caseloads are a little bit lower now. Uh, does that present an opportunity? Um, how does contact tracing tie into variants? Will we be focusing resources on cases we've identified as specific variants? These are all very reasonable, basic questions that the State Department of Health has no answer to or no interest in answering. And I think as a healthcare reporter, you have to uh, be a little bit um, concerned about that when your State Department of Health has so little interest in explaining this process to the people who would benefit from it. Thank you. Dr. Trepka, have your efforts to promote contact tracing uh, been hampered by, the, as I said, the state's, you know, rather sluggish or lackluster uh, uh, performance here? Well, so uh, the the only contact tracing I'm involved in is what we do at FIU with our own mm -hmm. students, faculty, and staff. And actually, you know, we collaborate with the Department of Health. And, and so we have an internal system that's very rapid. Uh, and so that functions well, but most places of employment don't have that. And so I think there's multiple problems. One was related to the just the incredible load, but also the the um, reluctance of people to pick up the phone. I think the people at Department of Health will say the biggest problem is people weren't answering their phone and, and they weren't willing to cooperate with the interviews. And, and you can go talk about the root causes of that, but it has led to um, the, the program not being as not as efficient as otherwise could have been. Um, again, I hope going forward that it might improve and that we would um, think it is going to be even more important going forward. Sure. Uh, we have a question from Mark Meinke, and that is, what will inform a decision to go back to normal, meaning no masking, 100% open, et cetera? How will that potential uh, uh, conflict with the governor, uh, that potential conflict with the governor be handled? Thank you. I think that question is for me. <laughs> um, Take it away. Thank you. So uh, we have had uh, orders uh, that I've continued from my predecessor, uh, then Mayor Jimenez, and uh, we do have the masking requirements, social distancing, and um, uh, uh, 
a disinfection. So we've had those requirements in place. We have the new normal guidelines. Um, I will be issuing updates to this in the very near future. We've been working very hard to try to take current knowledge, uh, which a year into this pandemic is different than what was available at the time that this guideline uh, was developed. So I think uh, people will be pleased to see that we have simplified things, made it much more accessible, um, easier to understand, easier to implement, easier to follow. So that is, is one thing uh, listeners can look forward to. The um, masking requirement uh, is absolutely essential. And while the state has prohibited the fining for failure to, to adhere to this, uh, we have issued citations as well as for establishments that don't adhere to social distancing or disinfection, uh, those, uh, those rules will remain in effect. Mm -hmm. um, they're very, very critical. Uh, we are on a good path. We have done better in Miami-Dade than the rest of the state uh, in many ways. And our hospitalization rate has been down and stable and uh, the ICU rate as well. The um, positivity rate is supposed to be at 5.5 uh, was what I had announced that we'll be revisiting next Monday to see where, we're do where we are with that. And two weeks of sustained uh, lower positivity rate definitely will help us uh, evaluate whether it's time to reconsider the curfew. So the curfew is one of the more controversial aspects of the protections. And we've understood through Jackson and through discussions with doctors Fauci and Burks uh, back in the previous uh, federal administration that the curfew was a valuable tool in our arsenal. Not the most important, but a very important tool. More important is the masking, disinfection, and distancing. So we've maintained the curfew. We have elicited the support of the 34 municipalities. So it is not just the county enforcing it. There are certainly instances of people observing um, behavior outside of what we've required. And when that is uh, known to us, uh, we've worked with the cities to enforce and we've also enforced in unincorporated. So uh, definitely those, those are in effect. And I do hope that we'll continue with these positive trends and we'll be able to revisit I know many are eager uh, mm -hmm. to to eliminate the curfew, uh, but let's just say from midnight to six, uh, a lot of times people are not on their guard. Uh, they may be partying, they may be having more to drink of an adult nature, and they're in packed uh, social conditions, and we don't want to have these super spreader events. So it has worked well for us mm -hmm. to have that curfew in effect, but I do hope that because of our strong adherence to these guidelines, we've done well. And if we can continue, everybody hold on, uh, we'll, we'll be able to relax. Now, we do have these uh, new variants. We do have the, uh, the advisories from the CDC. Uh, we, we need to be vigilant and mm -hmm. we need to be sure that we track the, the lives and the health of people and do everything in our power I, I just want to stop and say I am extremely grateful to the businesses and the individuals in Miami-Dade County who have gotten the message, who acknowledge the importance of the masking, the distancing, and the disinfection, and who've done a very good job, which is why we have been on a, on a very positive trend. Can you remind us again, what time is the curfew? It's midnight till 6 a.m. Okay, I'm good. Yes. <laughs> From an epidemiological standpoint, uh, Dr. Trepka, um, going back to Mr. Meinke's uh, question, what will going back, what will you need, what would you need to see in order for this community to go back to quote unquote normal? Well, I you know I think we have to take this in steps um, because frankly, you know, we don't have an experience. We we did never had an experience of this pandemic before, right? Getting into it, and you know, some things were handled well, and some things could have been handled better. Opening up again, it's going to be the same situation. So I think it's not going to be like you know, one day all the parameters of all the numbers will be okay. And we'll say, okay, everybody, everything's back to normal. I, it's, it probably is not going to work like that and, and shouldn't work 
like that. I mean, we take things one thing at a time. And I think it's a matter of getting rates down, uh, you know, getting rates down to, I mean, you have to realize that we still have more cases than we did in, in early October and our positivity rates higher too. Uh, getting, getting numbers of cases down and in, increasing the, the vaccination rates. So, um, you know, in the, I, I really think the fall is gonna feel pretty normal. We may still have to wear our masks in some settings, like maybe children in the classroom or in, in our classrooms at FIU or other crowded kinds of places. But I'm pretty optimistic that, that by the fall, things are gonna look, are, are gonna feel pretty normal. The summer, it's, it's kind of unclear. Again, it's a function of what happens with respect to the numbers of cases and also how quickly we can get uh, the majority of, of adults vaccinated. Thank you. Um, this is for the mayor. This is from Susan Brustman. How do you plan to help Miami reinvent its image? Does its image need to be reinvented briefly? Well, I think that a lot of people are voting with their feet and coming here uh, mm -hmm. both for travel because we are more open than so many other places, but also for relocation, uh, whether it's uh, people moving their homes for a better lifestyle and they can work remotely uh, or if it's for moving their, their businesses. Uh, so a lot of activity is going on and a lot of excitement. Um, if you're referring specifically to the problems uh, on Miami Beach, those are definitely issues that need to be addressed. Um, Miami Beach is clearly working on what they can do to uh, be friendly to visitors and have uh, activities that are uh, healthy and not disruptive. And, you know, that's that's the idea. We have a beautiful beach, we have a beautiful uh, district, and uh, we want people to come and enjoy it as well as to be able to live there. But I do not think we're in, um, I don't think we have to be ashamed or embarrassed about anything. I think people are coming here gladly. So I'm not, I'm not worried <laughs> about our image. <laughs> Uh, in fact, I think, as I say, we've done a pretty good job, given the constraints that we have, uh, to control this virus. And we've come together very strongly as a community. Uh, I've worked with not only the 34 municipalities, but the hospitality industry and others to, to really show that we can work together to handle a public health crisis uh, mm -hmm. and rebuild our economy. Thank you. Mr. Martin, I'd like to pitch that question to you also, maybe in a different way. Um, your, I, the, the, the buildings that you build, um, residential, commercial, um, are unique and are part and parcel of this, you know, building this community's image. Um, do you see the need to, you know, going forward, um, rebrand this community or or through your work, through your industry? And uh, if so, how would you do that? Yeah, I, I don't I don't know about the word rebrand. I think we need to evolve what our brand is and, and mm -hmm. really expand on a lot of the highlights that uh, that that we have. We're a community that leads, you know, with uh, environmental conservation, mm -hmm. uh, leads with improving our bays protecting our Everglades. Uh, that's something we want to continue doing. Uh, but we also have to now uh, pivot more to start thinking about how we deal with water, how we deal with sea level rise, how we how we deal with the flooding and its impact on small businesses. Uh, uh, so I think that that it's more of a, of a question of, of trying to look at as we go forward uh, who our city is and, and what we can do to diversify our economy, um, which, which I think there's several things. I mean, we're, we're definitely a trade and tourism market and we will always be a trade and tourism market. Uh, but the, the, the debate going forward is how do we attract new industries? How do we attract the, the financial sectors, the technology sectors, uh, and, and other sectors in order to really, uh, uh, provide more job opportunities and, and job creation for our economy. I think that's the most one of the most important elements of, of, our, of our society is providing you know, good paying jobs for our, 
for our citizens and for our community. And, and, uh, and I think that diversification in the economy will, will help. Um, as it relates to that marketing and branding to, to, the, to the market, I think Miami's always been a gateway city, an international city. I think this pandemic created an ability for, for the entire United States or all the Americans to really look at Miami probably a little differently than they did maybe 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, before they may have thought of us as, as more of a temporary stay a uh, tourism place, but not a place to live and, and have you know, great schools and great universities and, and great cultural offerings and great re retail restaurant offerings. So I think we, we need to continue to improve our offering. At the end of the day, uh, our cities compete with cities and, and, uh, and states would compete with states for investment and for, and for jobs. And, and so the more we could have a, a, a robust affordable housing pipeline, uh, the more we could have infrastructure projects, green infrastructure projects that can can help look and show the world that we we will lead the world in in solving uh, stormwater uh, uh, stormwater issues and, and mitigation and adaptation projects. I think the more we're going to con just continue to see uh, the um, the American world, the U.S. domestic uh, demand continue, as well as the international travel that we've always uh, really had in Miami. So I think this pandemic has shown that uh, diversity, uh, uh, not only uh, do we enjoy and allow anyone from all over the world or all over America to come and make Miami their home and really have very low barriers, social barriers for people to, to come here or, or really to start a business. But, mm -hmm. but we also have to look at um, you know, how we can improve ourselves. And, and I think that, that that's gonna be the focus, but I don't think we need to change who we are. We just need to, uh, to really enhance and, and, and uh, evolve, uh, which is what I think we're all focused on doing. And, and I think we're, we're doing a good job at it given the migration that we've been seeing over the last uh, six months. Thank you very much. We have two minutes left. I want to ask the mayor um, to just in one sentence, what would your call to action be for people in this community? Briefly. Get the shot. <laughs> the first thing that we could do is vaccinate our population. As Dr. Trepka started, that is our only pathway out of this pandemic is to get vaccinated. So I pushed hard to open up eligibility uh, to younger and different populations, and now it is moving forward. We do need more vaccine. I've been petitioning the state and federal government relentlessly for more vaccine. We can deliver multiple times what we're getting here and we will get out of this pandemic uh, as soon as we reach that level of, of uh, inoculation. And after that, I would say have hope because we are going forward stronger than ever. Our brand is strong. We are leaders and we will get through this together. Thank you very much. Um, I really want to thank all of our guests for uh, the generosity of their time and their wisdom. I too have a call to action, which is if you want to hear more of this, if you need to know more of what is going on in this community, please subscribe to the, uh, to, uh, to the Miami Herald, both print and our digital editions. And uh, I think the more informed we all are, um, the more we can take a smarter action to improve our own quality of, of life here. So I'd like to thank uh, uh, David Martin, uh, Mayor Daniel, Daniela Levine Kava, Ben Konark, and um, Dr. Mary Jo Trepka. I'd also like to uh, thank our viewers and their very, very astute questions uh, for joining us today. Everyone take care.